Hi, everybody, and welcome to Stoked, the ultimate Star Trek online podcast. This is episode 118, and I want to say good morning to all of the fine, lovely people in the jblive.tv chat room who have joined us today for uh, <laughs> Happy Easter. Is, uh, nice. Look at that. What a nice chat room. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me on Stoked. We got a really, really big show today. In fact, it's so big. We've actually had to chop it up a little bit. We were going to include a Foundry Files in this week's episode, but to keep things a little more compact, we've moved the Foundry Files out into its own standalone video. You can watch that in the show notes, so grab that. But there's all kinds of things we're covering this week. First up, Daniel Stahl's been in the news. He said a lot of things that I think I'm going to try to boil down and deliver you the most important bits. But we've also seen some new content hit the game this week. There's the Federation First Contact Day. And that new, that introduced a new map that we'll uh, chat about in Tactical View. We'll also talk about the new KDF mission, Alpha, in Tactical View. But that's not all we're doing. We're also going to kick off our DOF starter guide. This is episode two of our DOF trilogy. We introduced the trilogy with a chat with Heretic. We're going to give you the beginner's guide to the DOF system this week. And then next week, it's our advanced guide to the DOF system. And there's so much meat in these segments. Prepare your brain buckles and get ready to learn something about the DOF system because we're covering it for, with some of the experts on board. It's a ton of, ton of information. So prepare for that. First, why don't we chat about this interesting bit of news? Besides the new content we got this week, which we'll cover in just a bit. Daniel Stahl says stuff. Update. Daniel Stahl made the rounds not only to some shows, and uh, but also with a live community Q&A during First Contact Day. And the topic of the KDF came up, as it often does with these talks with Daniel Stahl. And one of the questions, which is sort of like the famous question, is when will the KDF faction be complete? And Daniel Stahl kind of backs up and talks about how people sort of have this expectation of the Horde in WoW for the KDFs, and how that was always in flux during development. But the reality of the situation is where they're at now is in order to sort of flush out the KDF and make it as content complete as the Federation, they'd essentially have to hire a content team to generate all of that. And when they look at their numbers, Dan says they have about an 18% player base for the KDF. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is according to them, Perpetual World has released data from a survey they did before they started their effort on Star Trek Online indicating only about 18% of players are actually interested in playing Klingons. Or I, I'm sorry, their data indicated 20%. 18% is the actual for Stowe. Uh, this data has sort of been confirmed by CBS as well. So Cryptic's now kind of looking at this and saying, we don't think that's really the direction we're going to go. This isn't a surprise to me, and I don't think it's a surprise to most people. I think we all kind of saw the writing on the wall. The KDF are what they are. I would imagine they'll become a more PvP-heavy faction. They'll have some more special events. There'll be reasons to play them. They're not going to be left behind. They'll just change, and our expectations for them will have to change. Uh, though, the interesting thing, and I'll include the link in the show notes, those perpetual surveys also indicated a very low level of interest in PvP. So that might be something. If they're looking at that 20% figure for their KDF data, they might want to look at that, uh, the other data. And uh, we'll put a link in the show notes so you guys can see those charts as well. Um, lots of other things have hit the game, but I want to keep this top segment kind of tight this week. There's so many things to cover, so check the show notes with additional information. But really, let's go chat with Thomas the Cryptic Cat. And welcome to Stokes Chat. Today we have Thomas the Cryptic Cat joining us, who uh, we've talked about his works on the show tons of times. And I think you've even been on the show a few times, Thomas, but I just want to officially say welcome to Stoked. Hey, it's really excited. I'm really excited to be here, Chris. Uh, it's it's been fun hanging out in the live stream all those Saturday mornings, and now it's really cool to actually be on the show. I know that is that is true. Of course, now uh, we're doing this on a Friday night, so everybody's going to be kind of bummed they didn't get to see you. But we'll roll this, I'm sure, for them. Uh, I think what we should do is I got I got a kind of a like a history I want to cover with you. But before we jump to that, so that we kind of have some perspective on all of that, will you tell the folks who are watching kind of what you do at Cryptic Studios and what your involvement with Stowe is? Sure. I'm a uh, UI artist, so my responsibilities basically include um, all the icons that we add to the game, um, any new windows or buttons, things like that we add. I, you know, I mock those up in Photoshop. Um, whenever we add a new system to the game, the development of the UI, the, the way the UI looks, the flow of it, that passes through me. Um, so like the duty officer system is a great example of it, um, something that started from the ground up visually with me and you know boxing it all out and uh and then taking it through the whole process of uh um roughs to 
kind of storyboards to um, the actual final art that shows up in the game. Very cool. And uh, I kind of, when I think of your name, I kind of think back of uh, the old days of Stoked where we were covering all kinds of new things and uh, someone came along and they offered up to the community these examples of mini games. And uh, that was you, Thomas. And some of your work now has gone into the game and we've seen new things in the game, just like most recently in the Dilithium Mining event. But I thought maybe we'd take just a quick stroll down memory lane and uh, talk about some of them. And now, now that you have this sort of perspective, set, go what, a couple of years now in, right? Uh, or coming on it. Uh, about a year, a little over a year, okay. actually. So I'm curious now to hear if some of these designs you had are just completely impossible. This first one I want to start with is, uh, it's like a system sector map where you have the missions and uh, you can accept the mission and kind of gives you like a location of where to go to. I really like the idea of showing the, the, the map of the, of the area and things like that. Is something like this, is a UI like this conceivable today? Or is this, looking back on this, do you think, man, I didn't really know what I was talking about? Um, <laughs> I definitely didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, most of my, I, I'd say 100% of my mini games, I didn't know what I was talking about. But it's, that's a luxury that you have when you're a fan, is you can dream big and think big because you don't know the limitations of the system. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I still I still wish we could do something like that as far as a system map. The the problem with that right now is that there's no data hookups to these systems in terms of they each system is a door to one map, right? And so it's not like you go to a system and they can pick which map you go to. Um, so that's kind of the issue with, with that particular example. But I would love to be able to fly around and see, oh, there's a foundry mission here, or you know, there's a patrol and explore and all that stuff. I think I think that would be a really cool long-term addition to the game. But right now, it's not really set up. To right. Do it that way. Right. Yeah. That maybe maybe once that kind of capability is there, it would sort of uh, facilitate the need for sort of a revamp to something like that. Now, of course, you, the classic one here is sort of the original waveform guide analysis where you match up the waveforms. That's actually one we've seen come to fruition. Looking back at this, it's pretty much almost exactly what you envisioned a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, super exciting. I, I'll never forget, um, I, I knew it was going to be in the game, and I think it was season two. And uh, when season two was trying, they were trying to launch season two on Tribble. And then there was like a week, um, it was supposed to go to Tribble on Friday, but like the Beacon guy was sick or something. So they had to delay it until Monday. Uh, and I was just so excited to see the, the mini game in, uh, you know, live in STO that I was yeah. just <laughs> counting the hours down until that, that thing went live on Tribble. But that, that was, that was pretty amazing experience. Because I was, I was not employed by Cryptic when that happened. That was still when I was a, a fan. So, that was in, so, so they bought your designs at first and then decided to go from that step to actually hiring you? Um, well, so the, the process of me getting hired was completely independent of the, oh, okay. the minigame designs, actually. They, they bought those from me, and um, I sent them the Photoshop you know, uh, files with all the original artwork and everything. And then... Um, uh, I could just kept an eye on the jobs page until there was a, a web design position open, which was something that I was comfortable with and had a lot of experience in. So I applied for that and then got that job and uh, made the transition over into uh, UI art. Um, ah. But but yeah, there was a long period there between submitting the mini games to Cryptic and then it being implemented when I just I still wasn't you know an employee of Cryptic. I was just a fan, and that's that's why there's a memory, <laughs> a, a character of me in Memory Alpha. Um, if you go talk to Commander Thomas Maroney in Memory Alpha, that was part of my compensation for the mini game art. That's awesome. <laughs> so you get you get you actually your name. I just got up a jar in Deep Space Nine. <laughs> see how that is. Uh, well, you know, not to dwell on these, but I I look over at these and I just wonder if there's any particular one that stood out at you. You know, you had the conduit pathing control interface, subspace image mapping. Do you ever wonder if uh, do you ever sort of wish or, or dream to bring one of these to the games or do you think you're kind of beyond this now and sort of focusing on new things Where, what's your oh, approach to these now um no i would love to get more of them in um depending on the situation i think um i think you know if there was some way that uh, the j-man could work uh mini games in the crafting or you know acquiring items that you need um i uh it, it's a matter of finding the time and the appropriate place to use them. Mm -hmm. When I when I came up with the ideas, my idea for the minigame was to replace every like press F interact in the game with a minigame and it would just be you have a, a like five or ten different minigames and you just pick the one that's most appropriate. Um 
just kind of like how the first like two Mass Effect games did. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever you had to hack something, there was a little mini game that came up. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so now it's a, a situation of me realizing that isn't quite feasible, right? But but when we have a situation where we can make a new mini game and put it in, like the dilithium mining thing, um, that you know, then we'll, we'll see something new. And uh, I have talked to the UI programmer about um, the uh, the conduit passing one specifically, and he said that when you know that would be something we could see possibly in the future if there was a a um, a call for it, something appropriate we can use it for. Yeah, that does look like a particularly fun one. When I look over at these, I I that looks like it'd be a lot of fun. Now, of course, I'm sure it wouldn't quite look like that in the final product, but uh, that does seem quite interesting. All right, Irish, well, I've I've uh, taken up some of my time. I know you got some questions for Thomas. Yeah, I've got a few, but uh, he's also got something to pick up on there. Apparently, uh, Zeronius Rex in the chat room is going to tell your producer on you. So you've just, <laughs> in some way, given her something to pick on you for. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Sorry we do these live, Thomas. I know it sometimes it gets people busted. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, I get trolled. It's terrible. <laughs> well, he's working for the well, Risk we run for fame and fortune, I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Excuse me, fame and fortune? Am I on the wrong show? <laughs> well, we're working on it. We're working on it. Oh, fair enough. Right. So basically, what I was looking at there was that you did mention that, that when you were kind of moving from fan into a cryptic role, that you didn't go straight onto Star Trek Online. So, how did that kind of work that you went through? I think it was web design, was it? And then found your way back to Stowe? Yeah. Yeah. I started on as a uh, graphic designer for the uh, Atari at the time, uh, Cryptic Atari Shared Services, and worked. Um, was there for about six months, and it was awesome. I really love the web guys. They're a lot of fun um, doing. Uh, you know, I did some work on the, the Star Trek Online website. The Actually, the original website about the Foundry was something that I, I put together um, on the STO site. And there were uh, some other things we did, um, you know, maintained Stowe's website, Champions Online, a lot of, uh, like, Atari games that came out. Um, uh, on the side, though, like, as soon as I got there, I kind of made it known to the STO team that if they wanted to... Um, if you need me, buddy, help. I'm right here. <laughs> yeah. I'm right yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, actually, a lot of the early work on the duty officer system was nights and weekends, as far as the, the graphical design of the system was nights and weekends for me while I was working on the web stuff. Wow. Uh, because I really wanted to get into STO and help them out. And um, and uh, so, yeah, it was it was hard. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, um, but uh, it, was, it was rewarding, too, to, to be in the ground level at that, in, you know, in that way. Now the DOF system is sort of the theme of the week, and so you just touched on it. So, what? So what? What all do you do with the DOF system? So, um, <laughs> so basically, every every new piece of artwork that we add to the DOF system, you know, goes through me. So, um, all of the unique DOF portraits that we have, like oh, the, okay. the Zindi guys and all that stuff, that stuff that I made. We 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 started out for the DOF portraits with uh, about. Uh, two or three hundred like pre-generated uh, portraits, and then from there we wanted really special, unique, uh, unique guys. So that was stuff I went into the character editor and made, and then I had to do some Photoshop touch-ups. Like we don't have anything in the game that really looks like a Zindi Aquatic, right? So right. I did the best I could, and then I with uh, with the game editors, and I took that and you know played around in Photoshop until I got something that looked okay. So there there are a lot of a lot of things like that, and. Um, Actually, uh, coming up soon, there are going to be a lot of really new, uh, a really cool new um, themed DOS that you're going to be able to get that uh, I was working on this week. And I don't, I don't want to ruin the surprise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, but you, you we'll will. find out soon, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt there, Irish. No problem. Uh, interesting conversation about the interesting DOF teases. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, the one I've got for you next was about the scanning minigame. You kind of covered it a little bit earlier. It was... You weren't working for Cryptic at the point where that found its way into the game. Were you involved in all that process, or was it just a case if they took your design and then ran with it and let you know that it was going in? Yeah, uh, so I, I emailed my, you know, I mean, emailed the art to them and filled out a contract and everything, and then the um, uh, the in-house STO UI artist took it and did their thing, got it ready for the game. They didn't they didn't really need my help or ask for my help after I sent the original design in. And there actually are some small tweaks in the design that the, the STO team did um, after they got their hands on it. And so mm-hmm. that guy's name was, uh, his name's Eddie, but he doesn't work at Crypto anymore. He he moved on, but uh, he, he was a really cool guy too. He was really helpful when I moved over mm-hmm. to UI. That sounds nice. Um, he did a lot of the original work on the STO UI and a lot of work on Champions UI. He was kind of Cryptic's UI art guru for a long time. I see. 
So did that differ for you now when, with your, your recent game, the, the lithium mining events? Did you have a different role in that, obviously, because you were inside the company this time? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, that was from start to finish. That was, you know, I was involved with the art to that. So um, it was, you know, we need, we want to do a new new game. It's going to be a matching game. And um, so immediately, the reason it looks like a triangle is because I was thinking of the mining lasers from Star Trek Six. Awesome. Totally, totally what I thought of when I saw yeah. it, too. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad that's what you thought of, because that's where, where my head was at. So, uh, so I wanted to make something that was evocative of that, um, something that was, it had to be faction neutral and think dilithium and all that. So, um, so from from concept to cutting it up and getting it ready for for the UI programmer, that was that was me all the way through. Okay, uh, slight change of pace today. Being forced contact day when we're taping this, uh, we've just gotten our first look at Utopia Planitia, and it looks like you did all the decor from what I can see. Your patches are <laughs> everywhere in there. Yeah, um, that the uh, tumor boy was the environment artist who made that, and he came to me and and he knew that I had done like the Odyssey class patch and said, hey, we're doing Utopia and Panisha, do you want to do some more? And I was like, yes, <laughs> of course I want to do some more. Um, that's my my personal philosophy on a video game and an environment and just a, a, a fictional universe in general is the more details you can add and the more like immersive it can be, the better, right? Because it, it just reinforces that feeling that you're there. And that's mm-hmm. really important to me as a gamer, as somebody who appreciates stories and stuff like that. So I felt like spending the time on those patches would really help sell Utopia Panisha and make you feel like you were in that environment. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Mike Okuda and Rick Sternbach, the guys who made the original um, you know, Galaxy Class patch from the, the TNG Tech Manual. So I, I really wanted to you know, just get in their heads a little bit and figure out how they would do that for all these other starships that we love so much. How so, do you do that? How do you get in their heads exactly? Um, well, um, you know, I... You read the tech manual, and a lot of it is looking at um, set dressing. So, for example, Enterprise is a really good source for that because uh, at, um, is it 602? Is that the name of the club on mm-hmm. Earth? Oh, um, yeah. They, they had a whole wall that were just like NASA patches and, and fake mission patches and stuff like that that those guys made. So looking uh-huh. at those. Oh, I mean, okay. a lot of it is, is just knowing that um, Mike Okuda's inspiration, who did most of those, came from NASA, right? So just looking at all the Apollo and shuttle yeah. mission patches and, yeah. and coming up with things that kind of mirror that. Um, so you've done some looking into his background and their backgrounds mm-hmm. to figure out what inspired them, and that kind of helps drive some of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, it's it's really fun and I really, you know, those guys were my heroes growing up reading those those tech manuals. Oh, I loved those too. Yeah. 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 Loved them. Very good. All right. You, Very cool. You probably got a book full of them, Chris. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I might <laughs> even have one out here somewhere. <laughs> I'd be surprised. It's, anyway. it's worth noting that uh actually I made quite a few more patches than Nick ended up using because uh, he wanted to stick with ships that were actually developed at Utopia Planitia. So, like, I don't think the Akira is up, but I made a patch for the Akira and some other, the Olympic class and stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to be releasing high-res versions of all this stuff on Monday, on probably through Twitter or something. So uh, Excellent. people can get Excellent. their hands on those. Cool, dude. That links into two the, the next two questions are actually direct jumps from there. One of them is, and I've just seen it in the chat room as well. Uh, do you think you're ever going to release these patches as physical patches, like that people can order from the site? Uh, I would love to do that. Um, that's certainly a business decision, and uh, I don't know if it's a licensing issue or not. There's, I know that uh, Cafe Press has a special deal with um, uh, with uh, CBS, where any fan can sell a Star Trek related sign on Cafe Press. So. You know, um, maybe it's just a matter of SEO having their own cafe press store, um, which would be which That's would be so great. Bad. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, that would just be we need somebody to set it up and take care of it, right? But right. Um, uh, that's certainly a possibility. Huh. Yeah, because we've got guys in the chat room here who are basically offering up their firstborn for those patches. <laughs> uh, well, now everybody wants everything. Everybody wants iPhone <laughs> apps. Everybody wants badges. Gosh. Now, how about everybody? Priority? You started this, Chris. How about we get the DOF app and then we get badges? How about can we? Can we <laughs> I'll give you that. that. Okay. Yeah, well, well, the next the... one might be easier then. All right. What's yeah, that? Sure. The next one is the, the same concept: getting those badges, but as something the players can earn inside the game. Yeah, and I've talked to I've talked to Heretic about this. I've talked to uh, Cryptic Matt, the um, our lead character artist, about um, 
having some of these patches, like I made a patch for, you know, Starfleet Applied Sciences, for example. So, like, if you get to level three in the DOF system, accommodation reward, then you unlock that for your character, right? That'd be really cool. Um, so we've talked about that. That needs uh, that needs some tech overhaul in how those, those fleet patches work for us to be able to just, like, stick new ones in there. But it's certainly something that we're thinking about and that we really want to do. Because, um, yeah, I think it would be cool to have a... Um, on your ship or on your character or, you know, maybe in your fleet star base, uh, you know, a badge about uh, the Starfleet sciences, or Starfleet tactical, all that stuff. Oh, yeah, that would be very awesome. Yeah, it's another level of completely making your character as unique as you can. Like, those patches combined with your ship and whatever else, it would be interesting to see that kind of customization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, next one, slight change of approach for you. Uh, you did talk earlier on the fact that you've got a lot of bits of your work who are kind of embedded throughout the game in parts we may not have heard of. Like, I, I believe you overhauled the sea store and you overhauled the ship selection UI. But yeah, so I did. What the, else um, have you got your hands on? <laughs> so, the, a lot, I mean, everything in, in SDO is a, is a team effort, right? So we have the, um, so like, I'm the UI artist, so I, I kind of, figure out how it looks and then we have the UI programmers and uh who, who get it working and everything. Um so I don't want to say that I overhauled the C store because, you know, there's <laughs> a lot of people who do a lot of work on, on this stuff. Um and actually the C store um was that was when I mentioned Eddie earlier, that was one of his projects. Uh, mm. the last things he did for STO was the C store overhaul. Um what I do now for the C store is like um uploading all the images like the DOF pack, uh, you know, with the three DOFs and the, the runabout or whatever, all those making all that marketing art. So I'll do that for the C store. Um, the Odyssey bottle, having the three Odysseys flying towards the camera, you know, stuff like that. I get to have a little fun. Nice. Uh, making the, the big art for the C-Store. Um, so I do that. Uh, every every new icon we add to the game, so power icons, item icons, um, I make all those. So you, know, you would tell me, though, if somebody came across your desk and said, Thomas, I'd like a mock-up for poker. You'd you'd be you'd come on here and you'd say, Chris, somebody asked for a mock-up of poker, right? Right. Yeah, I, w I would tell you that, but right. that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um, All right, Thomas. Well, is there anything you want to cover before we run? Uh, no. Thanks a lot for having me on the show. I'm uh, I'm actually I haven't seen Utopia Panisha yet in game yet with my character, so I'm excited to go there and get my uh, Phoenix. Well, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking all about it in the complete episode because it'll we'll, you know when we're doing this live on Saturday, I'll be running through that with the live stream, and we'll have a I'm sure we'll have a chat about that. Well, Thomas, thank you for coming on the show, and thank you for chatting with Stoke. Welcome to Tactical View. So a few things hit the game this week, but not only that, it's the continuation of our DOF Trilogy episodes. In this segment, we're going to cover some beginner guides and tips and tricks to the DOF segment. That's why Irish is here. Hey there, Irish. Hey, and, Chris. Uh, Perform you. Then uh, you're going to be back next week, too, for like a, for the sort of third incarnation of our DOF coverage, where we're going to get some more of the advanced heady stuff that is not really probably appropriate for a beginner. Uh, but it's not all just yeah. new tips, right? It's kind no, of not at all. The what this is, it's going to be like a guided tour of the DOF system today, and then the heavy stuff will be left over next week where the real experts will kick in, like people like Zero Bang, Lucas Purcell, uh, Brooklyn Knight, and I believe Silver's even going to do a piece on how the gains from the DOF system are going to be used to benefit your combat capabilities in space and ground. Okay, so that'll be next week, and that's interesting. So a real way to tie in, because that was one of the things Heretic mentioned in his interviews, he felt like the DOF system sometimes runs the risk of being this detached minigame, and so if Silver has some tips where that where that kind of connects the two worlds, the, the main game and the DOF system, that I think will particularly pique my interest. But before we talk about that, the uh, the new Federation event hit the game this week, the Utopia Planitia event, where you go around, talk to the uh, Enterprise F crew and get uh, tidbits, and also some original Klingon content, a new mission that I haven't gotten to play yet because I'm a slacker and my KDF tune is is uh, a little uh, too low for that. I'm a bad person. But why don't we talk no about excuses. the... Uh, let's talk about the uh, first contact anniversary mission First, uh, I'd say, Irish, my first impression was it was uh, very shiny. Like, I got distracted by how shiny it was, so much so that it actually derailed me from actually getting into the lore aspect of it. But what were your first impressions? Uh, first impression when I saw the actual map itself was kind of like yours. Like, I just want to walk around and look at everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
a couple of things kind of stood out to me. I was like, I don't know why the decisions were made, but I'm interested in it. there's something to it. Like you go to the right when you go in, they have all those uh, like JJ Trek boards up there, but with the Odyssey on them. But then when you go to the other side, they have the Defiant on it, specifically saying the Defiant. Right. I was like, that ship's like what, 35 years old at this stage. Why is it on those boards? Is there something we're getting a hint of or did someone just decide to put it because they like it? Well, that was actually kind of what I was wondering. Is I was wondering if it was a hint. I thought maybe mm. it might be. It could be, or it could just be maybe it's a good design and they're, uh, I don't know, looking at it for new ship designs. Who knows? Well, they, have, they haven't changed the decor in four decades. Well, Starfleet. maybe they just recently brought it up. I don't know. I, geez. I will say it's this. Interesting, though. I will say this. I liked the ambiance that those provided. It felt like a very yep. Star Trek headquarters type place. Uh, the special dressings on the doors, um, the, the, extra, the extra care to the texture and, and, and ambiance, it felt like it felt like a lot of times when you buy something from the C store and it's just that extra polish, sort of like the toss bridge pack or uh, the Odyssey bridge, how it's just a step above most stuff in the game. Um, yeah, and uh, the signage, uh, the holographic signage yeah. is getting really fantastic compared to when it started. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Uh, and I, of course, had to take a demo uh, of this and those of you who don't know the demo record function is really neat because you can capture the whole zone and then fly around in it and when you fly out there that 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 room that utopia room is actually inside a giant space station it's not just like some sort of room stuck out in the map they actually built the full dang space station with actual starships out in dry dock i mean it's very very well done so are you thinking future mission where you're going to go from interior to exterior with no zoning well, I don't know. See, I wonder if that was maybe some of the original design intention, but a part of the problem was is this, this, the station is so big that the client actually has a hard time rendering the entire thing. So I, yeah, maybe, I saw it looked like it was cloaked on when you, when you went too far away from yeah, it. Yeah, so it might, not be, it might not be technically possible at this point in time. But uh, I, if that exterior has access in the foundry like the interior does, that'd be really great. But we do know the interior is in the foundry. Yeah, and what I'll be curious, I'll get in and play with during the week, but I'd like to know if we could drop ship models outside those windows. Because that's something that's always a neat trick to, to fake a ground map as a space map, but you have very limited assets to do it with. Like, you can throw a meteor out there, or I mean, it's a comet, actually, and it makes it look like you're in space. Elevate the ground and put the comet in, so. You seem kind of bummed, nice too, to that, real ships. that they're taking this zone away after the, at the end, when the, whenever yeah. the event wraps up. This isn't going to be a permanent thing. Uh, it kind of worries me a bit. In that. Yeah, it worries me, because, like, We've seen this happen already with the, the space part of the map where we got it for one quick mission to get the free ships, the, uh, the cruisers, what they call the flagships. Yeah. And we haven't gotten it back in there yet. And it just strikes me, if we're going to have this amount of work put into putting in a zone, it'd be nice if it was something permanent. Now, I'm sure they don't intend it as a throwaway piece of content, but it worries me that with all the stuff that's coming up and that we're hearing about, especially with the Season 6 thing, little zones like this could get left behind. Hmm, I almost... Like, I almost look at it in the opposite way. Now, we don't have the space zone in the foundry, but the fact that we have the interior in the foundry, to me, almost implies that designing for the foundry first can be a priority. Uh, and I bet we see this every year on First Contact Day or something like that. We could, you know, yeah. we could, they could do something like that, or, or if they're going to preview a new ship in the game, they could stick a model in there and then open it up as an event and sort of generate buzz. So I don't think we'll never see it again. But I honestly am sort of comforted by the fact that they're sort of willing to say it's worth our resources to build something that's almost exclusive to the foundry. Yep, and the second piece that I like the idea of is if we're talking fleet advancement, star bases stuff going ahead in Season 6, which seems to be the general topic, mm -hmm. then maybe what we're looking at here is that this is a zone that we're going to get where you can start creating components for that. Because I, I noticed that even though it's a social zone, you don't have access to banks, you don't have access to exchange or anything like that. So it looks like it's a very basic social zone in that you can just have multiple players on there. Hmm. Hmm. Might be a foundational thing. Uh, all right, so uh, be sure when you're there, don't be like me. Don't forget to pick up your uh, your replica phoenix like I did. I got so distracted by how shiny everything was that I literally, I literally was like, I got to go check this out in demo record. And I logged out of the game and I started flying around inside the demo record tool. Totally forgot about the phoenix. Living the stereotype, Chris. Living the stereotype. I know, I know. All right, Ooh, well, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to try the uh, new KDF mission, but I presume you did because yep. you're a big oh, KDF yeah. player. Uh, what did you yeah, think? Like, um, it's actually... For a new mission, like there's a danger where people come along and go, oh, it's the first mission, I'm going to criticize it over everything because I haven't seen anything in between. But if you go in with a fresh thought and this is a new map, the space zone is fantastic. You zoom in, you've got your usual kind of debris stuff, you've got some nebula clouds, but more importantly, first time I've ever seen this, you have a gas giant that literally takes up maybe 60-70% of your aerial view. 
Oh, it's massive. Like I don't know how they pulled it off. There's obviously some new trick they've got, but this thing is huge. Um, and you have a whole space battle around that area, so it's a, an excellent backdrop. There's probably some good wallpapers there for you. Oh, okay, cool. And I think possibly someone's been a bit devious with the way they've set up the, the the things you're fighting because they've mixed different types of weaponry. Like I spotted some Tetrion coming at me to take the shields. <laughs> there was some Transphasic in there, and then there was a Tricobalt in there. <laughs> so like someone's trying to be nasty. Yeah, so fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make sure they um, try all the different angles. <laughs> one of the keys to it as well is because of the way that map is built, and it's not really a spoiler or such, but you're going to end up fighting Nausicaan ships. So as a KDF player, that's giving you access to accolades that weren't there before, because now you can get kill accolades against Nausicaan ships, because they are a KDF faction. Ah. So that's a nice touch. It's a nice little extra they've gotten in there. So sounds the like pretty real... good sounds like a pretty good addition. Yeah. And the thing is that's not even the, the major part of this mission because the real meat of this mission is on the ground. Yeah. And the best way I can describe it to you is, I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but they've done something really cool in taking away your minimap without using a static effect. They've put a canopy of trees in, so it's impossible to see the ground. You basically oh, I just heard, see I, jungle. I saw in the chat room people are saying, the trees, the trees, and I was like, the trees? Yep. What are they talking about? Oh. That because, of the, because of the top-down minimap, the trees and a canopy means it obscures the ground. You have to actually figure out where you're going by sight as opposed to by minimap. That's probably really cool. It's a nice touch. You're lost in the jungle. Um, you're also you're looking for, I, I believe it's a, it's a crash ship, basically. But the best way I can describe it to you without giving away too much is it's Predator. It's basically what you're dealing with. Is you're going through the jungle, <laughs> you're looking for stuff, and something is hunting you. Nice. Nice. There's a little That's... minigame in there, too, which is what Thomas mentions in his interview. They got a little kind of, it's a wires-based minigame. So there's a couple of more toys going in there, but I just like the overall feel of the mission. How perfectly Klingon, hunting in the, in the jungle, having to use sight and, you know, not having cheating tools. I mean, be, and then it sounds yeah. like you might get hunted yourself, too. Yeah. What it, here's the way I'll describe this to you. Um, what I like about Foundry Missions more than anything else is when you have limitations in what you're technically capable of doing because of the tool set, yeah. you get creative. That's how Star Trek got good. I mean, really. Exactly. Because low budget meant they had to come up with new ways of doing things. Yeah. Now, you take a look at this mission, it strikes me as somebody went in who has a little bit of foundry skill, or possibly with the real tools, and went, okay, we have some limitations. How do we make an interesting story and dress up and hide the limitations? It works perfectly. Like, you play this mission all the way through, and you are going to see not necessarily the best story mission you've ever played, but in terms of the limitations that are on the tools and not requiring feature episode level of details going in there, it's a pretty solid mission. That's cool. Right on. Well, that's good. The Klingons needed a good mission, right? Okay, yeah, why, don't we, why don't we shift gears now and move into the uh, duty officer walkthrough? Now, we don't tend to do a lot of like these real hands-on how-to guide stuff in Stoked, but that's actually exactly why we're doing this, because we th kind of thought it was time we should. And honestly, the DOF system is a good one to dig into. So Irish has compiled, along with some of the guys back uh, from the uh, Jupiter Force, a very, very comprehensive uh, show notes companion to this segment. So if we move along and you get lost at any point, uh, do check the show notes because a lot of this is written out there. But Irish, where do you want to jump in at? Uh, first thing I'm going to do is give a little bit of a framework to how this thing is done. Okay. What we decided to do when we were going to go after this was figure out how big the DOF system really is and yeah. break it down into something that's like bite size we could deal with. All I really did to begin this was I put together a framework of what I thought were the key components. We passed it over to Brooklyn Knight, who is kind of our resident DOF expert. He's brought in ZeroBang from Duff Jobs Channel, Duff Jobs Spreadsheets, and also yeah. Lucas Purcell's in there. So he's kind of brought in the real experts from the broader community in to help him build this thing. So this is a pretty comprehensive guide. You guys have really worked hard on this. You guys have been working on this for a few weeks. Yeah, it's been about three or four weeks at this stage, and like I've I've seen massive changes. Like I've I've literally gone to bed and then I come back the next day and there's two, three pages of stuff added to it. So we should publish that at the end of this, probably, yeah? yeah? Okay. What All I right, tried to good. do today, like, if you look, you're talking about the show notes, you haven't seen the real guide. The actual yeah, show notes yeah, is about a page and a half. Yeah. And that's the abbreviated version. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like this thing is excessive. Yeah, so when we're all done, there's like a massive doc we'll probably publish to a public link or something and link that in the yeah. show notes for people. Okay. I, th right. I think what I'd like to say is I'd like to see the guys update it onto Wiki and get it in there because it really yeah. does deserve to help those guys out. And that's, that's the major source of information for most of our stuff is Wiki. I wonder, I wonder how hard that would be. That would be really awesome. That'd be a good contribution back. Yeah, I'd like to do it. And I think Brooklyn's on the same page. Cool, cool. All right. Yeah. The actual guide, the way we have this done and the way I have it in the show notes doc is... As if a new player is asking a question, and we're just trying to give a general response. So like the first thing here is, what is a duty officer? The quick description is it's intended in the game just to be junior officers on your ship, or essentially your lower decks crew. Like that episode of Next Gen where they completely ignore the bridge crew and go working on the lower decks guys. Uh, when you get the DOFs, it seems to be, according to Heretic, level 8 for the feds, and level 23 for the KDF, because they start at level 20 now. Yeah. 
So it's pretty early in the process, but it's it's still, I think it's about three hours of leveling thereabouts solo on a Fed player to open it up. And most likely around the same for the Klingons. Yeah, okay. Or sorry, the KDF. I keep saying Klingons. Right. Um, it's very much a trading card game. Um, you don't have a personality to these things the way you tend to ascribe onto your bridge officers. Sure. What you tend to get is it's a picture, it's some stats, it's a white, it's a blue, it's a purple, whatever it is. But you're constantly trying to swap them out for the next ones up. So that's I why honestly, it keeps getting called trading cards. Of, when I'm playing through it, flipping through it, I sort of visualize that I'm like sitting in my ready room with a pad and I'm sort of like going through the assignments for the day kind of a thing. Make it so. Yeah. Would that be an iPad or an actual pad? Well, I mean, it's, it's not an iPad yet. Yeah, there we go. But maybe Agent. in the future. See, served up a softball. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Characteristics basic for each staff card. Um, you've got a faction, obviously. Um, you've got species related to that faction. So if you're on the Fed side, you're going to get your typicals like the Cations and Andorians. If you're over on the KDF side, you're going to have your Lethians and your Orions. Okay. Um, you will find some things later on mentioning how you can get Doffs from the other side, just as you can with the boss through diplomacy and marauding, things like that. Um, rank comes into it which is typically related to quality as well so you have the usual white green blue purple and the actual rank on the doff card will increase as the quality does that becomes important for some missions that have a rank requirement on them mm, okay then you get into the real kind of intrinsic part of how it works with your ship which is the department and specialization so you could have like an engineering officer who specializes in shield technologies uh -huh. so two levels of differentiation there gotcha um Going down the next level below that, we have what we're typically calling traits. And this is the most common thing people will notice, that when you look in the interface force and you look at the missions, it will say this mission requires someone who has the common one these days, resolve and teamwork, but it's going to fail if someone has unruly. So it could be like a diplomatic mission. And you get some, on a KDF side, say you throw an Oscar in there, yeah. typically not going to have the right demeanor, you know what I mean? Probably yeah. has stubborn, unruly, that's right. going to screw your mission over. So you can kind of get a gleaning from that based on the stats they provide, but also just kind of your own Trek lore, what you know about how those characters are, they'll actually kind of be programmed to respond like that in the DOF system. Yeah, and that kind of information, like you will see some exceptions, because as Heretic said last week, it's not mathematically distributed across the, the actual species. So you may find a Nosigan that has positive traits in that respect. Right. And so that's gotta, a little special look. one side. Yeah, yeah, okay. You've got to pay attention. Yeah. Um... The next trick that comes up is really dealing with something like the roster count. Now, when you start off, you get 100 slots for duty officers, which you kind of think is a lot until you then realize how many variations there are, how many different mission types these things are required by, and how many species there could be, how many traits there can be, and then suddenly you realize that 100 is actually quite restrictive. Oh, okay. Um, you can increase that up to 400 uh, in one, I think it's in 25 slots are 180 C store points and then 100 slot increases are 580. Have you done that? Uh, I've upped my main guy to 200. And so I've it's been, not account wide, it's per, it's per character? Yeah, that's ah. the one thing about that. That is per character. Okay. But most people, I don't, well, there are a few exceptions. I shouldn't say most people because there's a couple of guys here who do it all the time. Um, Brooklyn is always complaining that 400 is not enough. 400 is right. not enough. <laughs> Get me? It's like... It, I'm not going at that level. I'm, well, he I'm brought, it, he brought it up with Heretic. Remember, we had Heretic on here. He's like, yep. can, you, can you increase that for me? <laughs> yeah, well, I can understand why. It's an important part of the game. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the key thing here. Is this is, it's an easily ignored part of the game, but it's becoming really important. And I think next week we'll solidify that when Silver talks about what it can do for your ship and your ground combat. Zero Bang in the chat room says that uh, nine characters, all of them maxed to uh, 400 DOFs. Wow. How do you keep track of all that? Oh, that's right. You have a spreadsheet. Yeah, he has a very great, that great one, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the next one, um, duty officer assignments themselves. Uh, you can get typical item rewards. Like, I've seen a couple of normal things like weapons and shields and ground shields, that kind of stuff. But I've also seen, like, uh, space turret platforms, torpedo mm. platforms, mm. extra little toys with usually, like, a 20 count on them. So you get it from a DOF mission, and you can use it 20 times, and then you run the DOF mission again and get a replacement. That is slick. Yeah, there's some great toys. That's the thing about it. Like, it, there's little hidden extras that you don't think of with the DOF system that it's going to give you toys to play with. I like that. Yeah, that's getting my that's getting me interested right there. Yeah, we figured once you got to the shiny, you were going to get on board. Well, I do like the idea of torpedo platforms. Oh, they're nice. There's some nice ones there. Yeah. Um, commendation XP, which is again picking up on what Heretic said last week. Originally, their idea for the game was that almost every activity you engage in provides you with some sort of an XP. Hmm. and commendation XP or CXP as it gets abbreviated to uh, it has various categories to work with so the first one is diplomacy for the feds the equivalent of that is marauding for the KDF because you don't really see too much diplomacy in KDF right. tactics yeah it makes sense 
Yeah, and there's some extra benefits to those. They're actually very specific categories because on the Fed side, if you get all the way to the top of rank four, you're talking unlocking some transwarps. So there's a direct benefit because it's yeah. the old ambassador thing. And yeah. for marauding, it's the same thing. You open a transwarps. Yeah. But there's also a little bonus there where getting to the max level allows you to get into the home sector of the opposite faction. Now, not into the home system, okay. but into the home sector. So I can get a Fed who can enter a Megaleonis. I can get a KDF who can enter a Sol. And what does that do for you? Access more DOF missions. Awesome. That is really cool. Okay. Okay. I right, see. It's just nice benefits. Yeah. So getting away from those two, you then got science, engineering, military, exploration, espionage, medical, colonial, trade, development, and recruitment. Recruitment is actually one of the first ones you're going to want because it's obvious. How do I get more DOFs? Recruitment yeah. missions. Right. Right. All right. Um, the actual categories themselves, and it'll help when we do the show with the visuals in it, you'll see this. Um, there's four ranks, essentially, at the moment for each of those combinations. The first one goes from 0 to 2.5k. And that'll take you a fair amount of time if you're doing this infrequently. 15k is rank 2. 50k is rank 3. And 100k is rank 4. Hmm. But even when you max at rank 4 in the current system, you can still gain XP up to 150k, which we believe is something Heretic is hiding to one side so that they can put in a rank 5. Ah, banking so, it. Yeah, well, it makes sense to design these systems and have them so they're extensible. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Room for growth, yeah, down the road. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, ranking up individually from like rank one to rank two or, and so on, you can get a title for your character, which is usually something in line with the specific commendation XP that you've ranked up in. Well, obviously, Ambassador being the classic example there. Um, now, what else we got here is see access to more missions, which is understandable. As you level up through each rank, you're going to get more missions in that available with better rewards. So if I'm a rank three in diplomacy, I'm going to get better diplomacy missions than a guy who's rank zero. So, and when do, when do chains, am I jumping ahead, but when do chains sort of yeah. become part of the gameplay? Is that... They popped in very recently. I believe it was the last major update that was done. Right. No, but and I mean, when you're actually playing the DOF system, does it, do you get access to the chain type events right away yeah. or is it... Okay. You, you'll get them almost right away. And the thing is, you won't even realize it sometimes. I didn't when I saw it first. Like yeah. they, they put, when the DS9 expansion went in, they changed the color of the DS9 related missions. Yeah. And then you start noticing that it would say mission XXX and then in brackets one slash four. You're like, oh, this is like a right. sequence. Right. Mm. So it became more obvious. And then they put a little UI in called assignment chain. So you can see all the ones that are out there and how many of the components you've completed. Gotcha. So, that one, I'm not going to step on too much because that's going to be part of the advancing next week because the assignment chains okay. really are one of the, kind of like the cherries on top of this thing. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah, okay. Totally. We can talk about it more later. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, let's see. Rank four, enter home sectors, cover that. Transwarps are covered. Additional duty officers. Now, there's uh, quite a few ways of doing this, and I think I might even miss one or two. Um, character ranking. But when you level up your actual main character and you increase in ranks, I believe it's like when you hit lieutenant, when you hit captain, mm -hmm. and so on, you get um, a mission to go back to your home sector and talk to the recruitment officer there to get a DOF pack. Ah. So you get like lieutenant commander one, captain, I think I even saw a rear admiral one, and then corresponding over on the other side. Um, what happens then is you can unlock those packs through the interface. I'll show you that in a while. Recruitment missions themselves are picked up Again, in your home sectors, go into the interface. It'll say, go get a science officer, go get uh, a right. cadre of engineers. Starfleet you Academy is always a great source on the Fed side for that. Yeah, even outside the social zones, like you pick recruitment up. What I typically do is I look at Starfleet Academy, you zone up to ESD, catch the missions there, zone out with the Sol, get some missions there, yeah, yeah. and then just start branching out. Mm -hmm. Like, just, there's plenty of ways of doing these things. And I do this fairly casually the way I do it. I'm, I'm almost like autopilot when I do these things. Um, the next one you've got is trade-in missions. This is an interesting one because it's only recently been added, I believe, with the, with the DS9 pack. On Starfleet Academy, when you go in, you have the, they've opened up that other building across from the main one. And Lieutenant Farah is in there, the Cajun who does most of the DOF assignments. Uh -huh. But behind him, he now has uh, another officer who does these trade-ins. So you, it's like underperforming officers. You bring in and you say, okay, I have five white quality officers that I'm kind of sick of. I'll give you all five. Give me a blue one back. Oh, nice. Or I'm going to go, I have five blue. Give me a purple. Ah, is it actually that? Is it back. actually that, that, that math? Oh, okay. Yep. It is. Okay. You go in with five of whatever quality level and you can get one of the level above. Oh, okay. So it's part of the trading. And it's literally, you can do it anytime. You have a bunch of whites you want to swap out. I got go plenty in. of white DOFs from the recruitment missions. The earlier recruitment missions that I did, I just yep. got tons of them. So I should totally do that because why not, right? 
Yeah, but because there's a why not from two weeks ago. If you wanted the dilithium more than you wanted better duffs, do you oh, have a decision? Oh, like, right. I can get dilithium by dumping a duff, don't I? Yep. So now you have a choice. Do you want to get the lithium for these guys or do you want better officers? Oh, man. Always choices, Irish. Always choices. Leadership decision. Leadership decision. Yeah, that's the kind of tough call a captain's got to make, guys. It's the kind of tough call. Yep. That's what I get for Well, at least on your seat. Fed side, not your KDF side, because you're not actually that high yet. Uh, you can get more DOS for the lithium as well. And this is why I mentioned that is that you can go in and buy some, um, oh, yeah. some quite good ones. And the store, the way it works is, depending on what level you are in any of those commendation ranks, you can buy the equivalent DOFs, usually for tokens. And then when you max it out, you can buy them for the lithium. So you can go back and pick up the ones you didn't get. Okay. Because you are kind of forced to make a decision of like one out of seven different variations. It just gives you more options down the line. And that's probably where these guys are going with their 400 slots. Yeah. Collectors. <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah, I know that's what it is. Yeah. That's now, here's your next one. Actual DOF assignments can grant you more DOFs. You can actually do a DOF assignment where at the end of it goes, hey, we picked up two new officers. Oh, that's nice. Yep. Um, for the STF people, the token vendor has, I believe, Borg duty officers available. What? So you can get your SCF tokens and trade them in for Borg Duffs. Uh -huh. um, energy Credit Exchange. And this is, uh, seems to be a bit of a lifeblood here. You can just go to the exchange and purchase. They have a whole series of categories now for finding specific Duffs and then buying them. So there's a, there's a little economy on this as well. And it's an energy credit economy. And nice. then the mission you just did, the feature episode Facility 4028, you get a little taster at the end of that by getting a Dominion Cadre. Mm -hmm. So again, that's some free Duffs and they're good quality Duffs as well. Yeah. Now, yes. it's getting a bit heavy in backstory here because we still haven't actually talked about how you play it system, so we're nearly there. Um, the DOF assignments themselves, where you find them. Uh, you've got a thing called a sector tab, which is obviously when you're in sector space. Um, going through like each sector block has, what, three sectors in it? Yeah. That's three different zones where you can pick up different missions. So you can already see there's a lot of travel involved. And the people who are very dedicated to doing this, you will find them flying around the entire galaxy, sector by sector, to find the specific mission they want. <laughs> yeah. You'll see that with the DOF job sheet. That's one of the things it does. Is it predicts for you where those missions are going to pop up and you can just go get them rather than keep checking every five minutes. Yeah, the hunting thing. Yeah, having to hunt a man is time. Oh, so next time. Yeah, um, the personal tab. That's a new thing because it used to be, I believe, shipboard. And now it covers the missions where you can go inside your ship and talk to your people. So if you've got a standard Federation interior or KDF interior, you're going to be wandering around your ship talking to your officers. If you happen to be one of the guys flying around in a bug ship or a Galar class, you literally go to a console in your bridge, you go, I'd like to talk to the following department, so you don't move at all. Mm. So it's a nice little perk to having no ship interior, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I suppose if you're really hardcore about it, you could do that, huh? Just always fly one of those ships. If you can get your yeah, hands on it. swap it out. Yeah. True. Well, that's the other problem. Uh, there's still some on the exchange. Though. I saw one gem had our ship there the other day for like 450 mil or something. What about a shuttle? Yeah. Uh, shuttle, yeah, same thing. It's in there, but I haven't tried to do DOF missions in it. Maybe yeah. one of the guys in the chat rooms does. I wonder, That's I'll watch the chat room, because I wonder if you could do it in a shuttle, because then you could just equip one of your characters with a shuttle all the time and just make it your top. See, that would save you time. Yeah. Don't be giving me ideas, because I'll sort of try that. I'll go on the Delta Flare and give it a shot. <laughs> um, right. Social zones. Starfleet Academy is actually a social zone, but there's loads of DOF missions down there. ESD will do this. DS9 does it. So oh. go through those. And Zero Bang, the by the way, says in the chat room that uh, you can't do it in a shuttle. Aw, oh, pity. No, I know. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, well. Um, now, that's pretty much the backstory to what these things are. So the next thing we're going to cover here is the actual interface itself. Um, this will work much better if you have it open in front of you. If not, I'll just go through the tabs and show you what you're dealing with. The first thing you hit is the overview tab. And it has a thing called a section called assignment summary, mm -hmm. which is going to give you the detail on how many missions you're currently running up to a limit of 20. There have been cases where missions are sitting on like sick bay and things. And it seems to tell you have more than 20 active missions, but they're not really 20 active missions. Or the extra ones. Um, second tab section you got is called Duty Officer Summary, Duty Officer Summary, which shows you how many DOFs you currently have on your roster and where they're currently assigned. Um, there is a breakout there. There's active space and active ground. You can choose five space DOFs or five ground DOFs, and they will provide bonuses to your combat wow. capabilities. Okay. So that'll be things like cooling down your transwarp faster or uh, increasing your shield distribution or on the ground. It could be something really cool, which I've seen, which is like an army of red shirts. Nice. Where you literally have uh, get a purple quality DOF that gives you the chance to beam in an additional security officer. I seen one guy running around in STF with eight red shorts following him. That would because be very he handy. Commands. He ran the command. Someone hit tactical initiative. He ran it again. So now he has like six of them there, and then he popped two quantum shadows. 
There's Old no Manhattan. cooldown. There's no cooldown. Brooklyn Knights is in the chat room. Oh, there you go. More toys. I want that. I want that. Yeah. I thought you would. Let's see, and you wait for silver. Silver will give you all the details next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Patience. Uh, accommodation advancement. Um, this is your. Uh, it's like a one-stop shop, a little graph, and it's on the right-hand side of the interface, and it tells you where you are rank-wise in each of the accommodation XP categories. It's the only real way you have to know what am I doing, what am I working towards, what's mm. the next benefit I'm going to get in terms of a title or an unlock. So it's like it's like I suppose the control panel for everything. Mm. Um, now the assignments tab is pretty much where you'll spend most of your time going and looking for the missions to run through. There's one thing to note is the bottom right corner of each mission bar will be a red icon. And that's if you see one telling you that you can't do this mission. And if you hover over the icon, it'll tell you why. It could be you don't have the commodity required. You may not have the duty officer required. Hmm. You may have the duty officer, but it could be on a different assignment. Yeah. yeah. So it, it'll try to tell you why you can't run this mission. Okay. I've run into that. Yeah, that, that's a quite common one, especially early on before you end up with like massive rosters like these guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. Um, the assignments tab with red icons. Da, da, da. Let's see. Opportunity correct. Ah, here we go. Some commodities come into it, right? Now, you can buy those straight from your replicator. So when you're in that interface and you see I don't have five provisions, I can go with my replicator straight away, buy them, and then the mission unlocks. Uh huh. So it's an instant fix for you once you've got the credits. There's only a few poor broken people that don't have like Wee Wee, no credits. <laughs> I think, he's, actually, I think I've seen him panhandling in Four City. It's he blew it all on Orion Girls. What can, it can't help the guy. It's his own mistake. Well, it's better than what Borticus did, where he was on Four City blowing it on Orion guys, believe it or not. And we have pictures to prove that. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, I do believe it. I do believe it. You probably got them to put it in the game. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> All right, uh, the duty officer tab. I think it's the second one across, third one across. It gives you your full roster, and this is the really detailed view. So you got all your guys in a big list, and then you click on any one of them on the right-hand side, you see a close-up portrait, you see any bonuses they'll provide, and you got a little detail on what their traits are. So for the real detail guys who don't want to do this as an autopilot, that's a useful tab. Oh, okay. You can also dismiss from there. So if you're like, I'm doing all my ults where I just keep flogging off the, uh, the doffs, <laughs> you can dismiss them from there and get the lithium for them. It's like, do a recruitment, put them on the ship, kick them off the ship, reap the rewards. Nice, yeah. That's a good system. I didn't even use the airlock. <laughs> no, not when dilithium comes into it. You'll spare, you'll spare them the airlock, right? As long as you get a little money. <laughs> dude, that, dude, that dilithium gets me my ships. That's important stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, what else we got there? There's a filtering for searching through them because it does get very complicated. There's a lot of categories to go through, so there's some filters at the top to help you search. Mm -hmm. uh, quality filter, specialization filter, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you get a breakdown of your active roster, your active space roster, active ground roster, and then some extra ones based on missions. The sick bay. If you run a mission and it doesn't go so well, uh, you can end up with your doff getting injured, and you got to put them in sick bay, which is basically like a lock point. Is they're stuck in there for X amount of time until they're healed. Okay. Okay. So that can be treated as if it's also a doff mission, and you can see that showing up, which causes you to increase over to twenty. Ah. Okay. So it shows so, up and it has a cooldown and all that. Bingo. Or a timer. So they use that's a smart way of doing it. They use the actual mechanism of the system to hide your DOS away because they're injured. Mm -hmm. uh, you got one you might like a brig. So when you do these missions and you pick up prisoners, you can throw them in the brig, and then you get missions to do prisoner exchanges. So you say, okay, well I'll give you five KDF prisoners. You give me that purple guy over there that you've kidnapped. You know me. I love incarcerating people. <laughs> uh, Think that's off a different show. We shouldn't go into that here. Okay. Okay. Um, the next tab is something I think is a work in progress because it isn't quite there yet because it doesn't do what I think it was originally intended to, which is the department head section. Hmm. The first thing you go in is you set up and give yourself a forced officer. Now I noticed a button today, the first time I've seen this, where my forced officer had a button beside for a mission, so I could click assignment and then it popped up one mission, as if it was something my forced officer would do. So I was like, hmm, I'll look into that. A little sneak peek, maybe, of something that yeah. might be hooked up in the future. It could be. These guys might know a lot more than I do, because I've never got a mission from that tab before. I've rarely gone in there after I set them. Interesting. Hmm. Um, you then got a list of your departments to design the heads to. So you got engineering, operations, science, medical, tactical, security. Uh, you put one of your bridge officers in each of those slots. And then what happens is when you're in your assignments tab, and the assignment requires someone from their area, they will suggest some DOFs to use. Now, I've been warned by the experts, it's not always the best ones they suggest. If you're on autopilot and you just want to click through, so be it. If you want to be more discerning about it, maybe question what they're offering. Okay. So, don't trust your own crew, basically. Especially in your case, they're all traders. No kidding. 
And let's see. Yeah, there we go. And uh, oh, yeah, I've got a tip on there. It was like, uh, tune in to Stoke 119 next weekend where the real experts will explain more of that to us. <laughs> um, now, that's all the, the preamble. That's a lot of it, but that is the guts of the system. Okay. So far, actually I'm, play I'm tracking. Yeah, it's, it's not that bad once you break it down. This is the thing about it. it. Tribal knowledge is something that's a little dangerous in this game because how many systems are there where players come in and there's nothing in their face explaining to them how this works? Mm -hmm. Or it's the wrong time. Like when you come in the game force, you don't want to hear about duffs when you're trying to shoot the board guys. Exactly. So it's when you pick that up and you tend to pick it up from other players more so than tutorials in the game. So mm -hmm. tribal knowledge becomes a very dangerous thing. You lose out on it. Yeah. Well, hopefully we're getting people's faces. We're helping. That's okay. one way to look at it. Yeah. We're getting in their face. All right. So what's oh, next? Either that or I'll put them to sleep. Um, the actual <laughs> running of a mission. Um, now, when we do this, on, when it's out in the episode, obviously not on the live stream, we'll actually show uh, a couple of missions being run, just going through the interface and doing it. So this might be a little dry to go through, but running an actual mission, you go into the assignment tab. You get there by minimap, little button beneath it for DOF system, click it, pops it up, assignment tab is there, shows you all the missions you can choose from. Pick the one you want. There's a text description to give you an idea what the story is, because even though it is pretty much a robotic thing, they do actually put some effort into providing some story to this. Um, you've got a time to completion, which is not always the same. Some of these things are going to have things like 30 minutes on them. Some of them will have five minutes on them, like the ones we saw in Second Wave. Mm -hmm. Others can have a day, two days, three days. Like, so pay attention, because that's how long your DOFs that you assign are going to be missing for. Hmm. Um, it'll give you a list of the rewards for the assignments, and that means numeric rewards, as well as you'll get a little question mark icon telling you there's items, but they won't tell what the items are. <laughs> so there's a little kind of a secret surprise at the end of going, yay, ah, they're rubbish. Or, <laughs> yeah, torpedo platform. Come well, on, it's, torpedo it's, platform. Big money, big yeah, money. It's, it's, it's a little surprising. It's like, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get something, I don't know what it is. All right. Um, so time to completion is important and rewards. There's another thing to the rewards is that you'll notice your DOFs have a little, uh, some of the higher qualities one, they have a percentage on the right hand side of their, their uh, DOF entry and it's like 5, 10, 20 are the ones I've seen and that's a bonus to the new numeric rewards. So you throw a guy in who has a t like a purple with a 20% bonus and you were getting 100 points, you'll get 120 points. Oh, nice. And that's across the board. That's the CXP, that's the skill XP and that's also the, um, uh, what's the turtle? Going blank. So, mm. Oh, the bridge after points. Mm. I never remember this. Mm. So it actually multiplies them all. And if you have a mission that has like five DOFs assigned and they all have 20%, you get double rewards. <laughs> and then all right. Here's I like double one. rewards. If your purples, because they have the 20 bonus, they're purple, they're probably the best DOFs you could have for the mission. Yeah. You then get a, a chance of getting a critical success. Yeah. And I have had that nearly double the original rewards as well. So yeah. that's a huge bonus from one mission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that too. That is really sweet. That's the sweet spot. That's why that's why it's worth not always playing just on autopilot, but actually kind of filtering yeah. through and picking the right the right ones. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to find because I'm talking to these guys and the level of detail they go into is crazy. But when I try it, it's like uh eh, click 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 done, click 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 done. Now yeah. let's go shoot something in the face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's probably well, been my approach. Yeah, but I'm starting to pay more attention to it because especially when you get up into the higher ranks, like up yeah. into the fourth tier, you yeah. need to be very discerning about what missions you're picking because you want specific XPs or CXPs. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, some points here we've got about um, failed missions, what can happen. Apparently, you have two classifications of fail. You failed and you have disaster. <laughs> yeah. Which just kind of makes sense. If you have success and critical success, you should have the opposite. Yeah, so yeah. a failure, you can get injured DOFs going off to the sickbay. A disaster, you can have your white quality DOFs dead. So you send off the white DOFs, they die on the mission. Might as well just get a, you might, should have sold them anyways and gotten that lithium for them. There you go. So the benefit of that means if you pop out the blues, the greens, the blues, and the purples, those guys are going to be in a situation where they're not going to die on the missions. They'll get injured. They will not die. So that, that's one reason to get rid of all your whites straight away and start upgrading. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else we have there. That's dying. Oh, yeah. There is one exception to that I've been warned about. The KDF had this wonderful mission called Execute for Incompetence. You can have a purple doff. If you put him on that mission, he's going to get killed. All right, good to know. So, He's, uh, there's, to watch there's just no win in that one, huh? No, that's, that's, you're literally choosing. And I use that on the KDF side to make sure I get rid of some of the whites that annoy me. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, the, the quality of the green, blue, and purple, it correlates directly to the percentage increase for the score points. So greens give 5% bonus, uh, blues give 10, and purples give 20. Okay. Okay. That's just pretty now, straightforward. Yeah, from an entry point, that is everything. That is the initial basics, that's the background, that's the system. All the stuff next week are assignment chains and the rewards you get, 
We have pro tips from Brooklyn Zero Lucas. We have the entire DOF guide going to be in the show notes, and I mean the advanced one too. The DOF job spreadsheet, the DOF jobs tracker, and the in-game chat channel. Oh, that's it all. Oh, oh man. That's going to be an awesome follow-up. So again, all the stuff that Irish just jammed through uh, is in the show notes as well if you lost track. But uh, Irish, those are some awesome beginner points for the DOF system, dude. That's, you know, I think that's exactly what a lot of people need to get started. So there you have it. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast of Stoked. What a big show! And I want to thank everybody on the team for working on a really big show. And I want to thank Thomas the Cryptocat for coming on and chatting with us. That was a lot of fun. And I want to thank everyone out there who supports the continued development of Stoked by using our affiliate links over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. If you scroll all the way down to the very bottom of the site, we just have these super easy links to click on for Amazon US, UK, Newegg, ThinkGeek, Best Buy, Mint.com, and Audible.com, which is fantastic. You click on one of those links before you shop, and a portion of your purchase goes to support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and is how shows like Stoked are funded. Also, over there, we have a Chrome extension if you use the Chrome web browser, you click that bad boy, you automatically get your session tagged when you visit those sites. You don't even have to worry about clicking on the links. Thank you, everyone who does that. That really does help support continued development of the shows that the fans love. All right, everyone. Well, I want to thank you now for tuning in and remind you that we are live, just like the fine folks in our jblive.tv chat room. We do this show over at 11 a.m. on Saturdays at jblive.tv. You can join these wonderful people and uh, talk about the different things and have happy thoughts like they are, and of course, give your feedback live into the show. So it's a great way to do that. Otherwise, you catch the show on demand on Tuesdays over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and you can download in just about any format you like, as well as subscribe to an RSS feed, and then you just get this show every single week automatically without even worrying about it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Stoked, and I'll see you right back here next week. Big map. Look at that. And the way I know it's big is because it's taken me a long time to traverse this in demo record, and it, you move really, really fast in demo record. Whoa. That's really interesting. Check that out. <laughs>